So you've seen awesome videos made using the Total War game series and you want to try it for yourself. Well, you've come to the right place because it's as easy as one, two, three. Okay, maybe that wasn't enough steps, but it is rather straightforward. So let me walk you through how to do it. Every Total War game since Rome has used basically the same key controls. You use W, A, S, and D to move your camera around. And if you press the K button, it makes the UI disappear, which frees it up so you can have nice clean shots of just what's going on on screen. That's K as in kite or kangaroo. And if you press N as in Nancy, you can zoom in. And using your mouse scroll button, you can actually enlarge parts of the screen and use that for close-ups and finding interesting spots in the battle. But you'll notice your pesky cursor is still up on the screen, so press and hold the middle mouse button while recording to remove it. You may notice that your default camera speed is far too high. We can't see what's happening on the screen. So press page down to slow its movement or page up to speed it back up again. If you're having a hard time keeping up with a unit, try pressing the insert button. It'll lock your camera onto that unit and you can now look around and move with them. This can be used to either film the unit itself or film the one standing next to them, providing you with a nice moving camera shot. To record in game, the least resource intensive option is NVIDIA GeForce Experience's Shadow Play software. If you have an NVIDIA graphics card with the GeForce Experience installed, then you already have the ability to record whatever is happening on screen. Just press Alt Z to bring up its overlay and then tap the button to record. This method is by far the least hardware intensive and requires the least of your GPU and CPU to be able to make something happen on screen. Now, if this doesn't work for you or you you have an AMD card, you can use OBS, which is most commonly used for streaming, but can also be used to just capture whatever is happening on screen at the time. And that's the gist of it. That's how the Decisive Battles TV series back from the 2000s was created, with these exact controls, and it's still fundamentally the same now. If you're having trouble filming large battle scenes at a time, try reducing things like shadows and texture quality for your wide shots where you're pulled far out. We won't notice them anyway. And then when you punch in for your close-ups, increase those settings back up again, but reduce total unit size, as we won't notice there aren't as many people on screen since they won't be in focus. Focus. Now, if there were a couple words in that last sentence you didn't know, like wide shot and close up, then you've actually stumbled onto the real challenge of filmmaking. It's never the tools that stop people from making something that looks professional. I've spent the last 10 years teaching students that you have everything you need in your pocket with an iPhone to make a theatrical quality film. It's all in knowing how to handle that pocket rocket. And yes, that joke plays exactly like you think it would with a bunch of high schoolers. The most commonly accepted shot types are an extreme wide shot, a wide shot, a medium shot, a close up. All you have to do is mix and match these and you have a film. If you're feeling especially snazzy, you can add some extra movement in. Pan the camera, dolly or track it left or right or in and out and help create movement in your scene. But none of this really matters if you don't have a story to tell. One of the hardest things to impress upon first time filmmakers is that everything should be telling us a story. You may just be filming a battle, but whose battle is it? Who are we following? Who are we actually rooting for in your video? Watch a battle scene from one of your favorite action films and you'll notice we typically have either one character or a small group that we're following through the chaos. It creates an anchor point for the eyes and keeps the viewer from being overwhelmed with what can quickly turn into just a bunch of random guys smacking each other. Mods created by other players can also be very useful in the creative process. The Steam Workshop hosts thousands of user creations that can do things like allow you to lower down the camera further than its default or move it even higher. You can even add new units or locations for you to film in. Another commonly used modification isn't hosted on Steam Workshop though. It's called Reshade. This is a post-processing injector. It takes your image and before it spits it out to your monitor, it changes it by either adding things like additional coloration or even a fake depth of field effect. Most all of the videos that you've seen recorded in Total War online that you thought, man, that looks so drastically different than what I'm playing are probably using a reshade preset. And you can find these in Buku's location. Steam Workshop actually does host pictures for you to then go download their profile to then put onto a reshade. But though they're cool, they aren't 
strictly necessary. Nearly everything that's happening inside of Reshade can be done in the later editing process as far as tweaking the colors and what you're going to see on the final screen. And the thing is, if you do that here when you're recording the footage, you can't remove it later. So you better like what you're filming ahead of time. The blurry depth of field effect, though, is unique to Reshade. It is something that has to be done this way, with one exception. If you have a Total War Saga Troy, it has a camera system built into it that you can use to film with. It's one of the coolest additions to the game. Um, it's called a photo mode. You can actually trick it and remove the overlay and keep recording with all those settings still on the screen. It is very cool and brings all the power of Reshade into the game automatically by default. After you've recorded all your footage, you'll encounter what many consider to be the hardest part of video creation, the editing. But there are many simple programs that you can use to start with to ease you into the process. First off, if you have a Mac computer, congratulations, you just won the lottery. iMovie is by far the simplest and most straightforward editing software to jump into. Or if you have an iPhone, you can upload your footage to something like the iCloud or Google Drive and edit it on your phone and then export the video back off again. I know this seems sort of an odd recommendation, but those little phones are just so amazingly powerful about what they're capable of these days. And the ease of use for something like this if you're getting started cannot be overstated. If you're on PC, well, it's a little less straightforward. By far, the most common software is the Adobe Creative Suite, of which Adobe Premiere Pro is the most popular in the industry currently. Uh, it's what I've been using for years now. It's even what I'm editing this video on but I wouldn't recommend it to anyone just starting out because among other things, it has a monthly subscription cost that can make your eyes water. If you think this video will just be a one-off, they do offer a 30-day trial and you can test out Adobe Premiere Rush, which is sort of their version of iMovie, meant to get people in and editing as quickly as possible. But if you're looking for something equally as powerful as the regular Adobe Premiere, but also equally as complicated, DaVinci Resolve is a free software that I would recommend to anyone learning to get into advanced editing. Most of these supposedly easy editors also try and charge you money, but you don't really want to be spinning that when you just start out. So you may consider something like ClipChamp, which is an online video editing service that was recently purchased by Microsoft as sort of a replacement for their Windows Movie Maker, which is actually how I learned how to edit over 20 years ago now. But you can actually use it as a free online editor, exporting your final video at 1080p resolution. When it comes to editing, think about it like this. You're putting all your clips in a row and then trimming off the pieces that don't make sense. You then mix and match them to tell the story in the most straightforward way possible. Because remember, you did have a story, right? You can add titles at the beginning and end and put a layer of music underneath. And whammo bammo, you are done. Now, of course, you can get much more complicated with this, downloading individual sound effects to add at certain key points to make something more exciting. Tinker with the coloring of the video videos to give it a distinct visual look, adding crazy transitions, whirls, and spins to help keep the viewer engaged. But think of all of this as optional additional flair. There are millions of tutorials on YouTube going on how to implement each one of these, and I always recommend people find a specific thing they want and then try and do that one thing. You always take small steps before you try and run. You'll notice that at no point did I ever say the words, were you born artistic or do you have that eye and gift? It's not a gift, it's a learned skill like anything else. And especially when it comes to filmmaking, it's one of those things that people believe that you just have to be that kid growing up. No, no, no. Everybody starts in the same place. Some may pick it up a little faster, but the ones that I know that continue to do it even today are the ones that stuck with it and pushed through the difficulties. So please get out there, try making your own films, take a crack at it, try our short film competition that we're currently running on this channel. And if you have any questions, ask them below. I'm always glad to try and answer answer as best I can. But thanks for watching and hopefully this encourages you to go out, try a new skill, and try to create something that others will look at and go, man, that was cool. How can I learn that from you?